here we are, you know, in the world of COVID, technological glitches are the new hiccups. My name is Jesse Fuentes, and it is a privilege to be your moderator today. Welcome to the Conversation Among X, brought to you by Tu Cuenta Cine Youth Fest and powered by HITN. Today, we will discuss evoking emotion, exploring the use of images and sound. As we discuss images and sound in the industry, I want to remind our audience that our live series leads up to a film festival that starts September 18th. And I wanna share with you a way to make this next project visible to a very important audience, you and young people across the country. You have an opportunity to submit your short film to Cine Youth Fest, which is dedicated to prioritizing the representation of Latinos in front and behind the lens. And we'll see what behind the lens looks like today as we discuss sounds and images. Cine Youth Fest has officially opened their submissions two days ago, and the submissions are totally free for the first two weeks. I want you to head over to CineYouthFest.org for info and guidelines and awards. Thank you for joining us for what's gonna be a critical conversation on film today. Before we meet our panelists and watch what will be amazing bio packages, let's take a look at mine. Jesse Fuentes is an activist and educator in the Humboldt Park community in Chicago, Illinois, popularly known as Paseo Boricua. Fuentes has participated in work empowering young people in the community, the campaign to release Oscar Lopez Rivera, anti-gentrification work, education reform, and for the independence of Puerto Rico. Fuentes is currently the director of policy at the Puerto Rican Cultural Center in Chicago. They strive to see a more just world through advocacy and policy. You can help him. Just think of a way and ask yourself, what would Oscar say? Oscar say he is a product of colonial aggression, that he has been beat up and made empty by the cycle of oppression. But our people need love. Our people have been raped, pushed over and shoved, and it must stop. We must pick up our women, nurture our children, and show our youth there's no need to be afraid of the cops, you see. This is just another example of what this system has done to our people. And this system will continue if we can't treat them like our equal. Que viva Puerto Rico libre. <laughs> these bio pics make you look so important. You see they do that side by side with me and AOC and then Bernie Sanders. It's phenomenal how important they make me look. I'm not that important. Uh, just kind of cool, kind of cool. Enough of me. I want to be able to introduce our panelists. We have amazing individuals who make film what it is. Without sound and without proper imaging, films wouldn't be anything but individuals reading scripts and running off of memory of what they had to to produce a film. It is these individuals that we're gonna have a discussion with that make film what they are. But first, I wanna be able to introduce Natasha Canepa Borrero, an amazing individual. But first, before we bring her to the screen, let's take a look at her bio package. Born in Puerto Rico, Natasha Canepa is an avid lover of art and animation, with her passion to draw dating back to elementary school. She has created the 2D short films Ready to Fight and Magic Play, the latter of which won several awards, including Best Local Animation at LUSCA Fantastic Film Fest in Puerto Rico. Presently, she runs a multi-service studio where she incorporates animation, motion, media, storyboarding, illustration, and post-production into numerous projects, from educational presentations to studio short films like Metro 6. Awesome. <laughs> it is a privilege to be here with, with you today. What do you think of your bio package? Did it do you justice? Yeah. Um, I, I really, w I really wish that I could have included uh, my recent short film, uh, Place to Place, because I, I'm really happy with how that came out. But with, with the bio package, I'm so happy with what I saw. I'm really yeah. going to use that uh, for my social media. Absolutely, I'll make sure all of my friends over at HITN send you your bio package so you can use it as you please. We're gonna talk a lot more about your animation work and your studio in just a bit, but let's make sure we introduce our next panelist, Ben Guzman, someone I am such a fan of. Before we bring him on screen, let's take a look at his bio package. Ben Guzman is an award-winning director, producer, editor, and storyteller from Brooklyn, New York. 
Most recently, he served as senior creative producer at Better Noise Music, managing a small team and creating content that led to three Grammy nominations and multiple RIAA Gold and Platinum records. Drawing inspiration from the music videos and films he grew up studying, he has spent the past decade creating a name for himself through his aggressive editing and highly stylized imagery. Garnering over 1 billion video views, Ben has created visuals for an eclectic group of artists such as The Notorious B.I.G., Nelly Furtado, Motley Crue, Kehlani, and Lupe Fiasco. His approach to each client and project is the same. Tell the story the way it should be told. Hey. How are you? Did you enjoy your video package? Yeah, that's wild. I've never seen it like that. That's crazy. Yes. Look, Lupe is my all-time favorite hip-hop uh, artist. What is that like? I am so jealous of you right now. Yeah, nah, he's incredible. Nah, it's it's uh it's amazing. It's cool to see it all laid out like that. It's like uh I've never had time to actually sit and cut a demo reel. So to have it all together, it's like let's get to work, you know. Yes, absolutely. One billion video views. We're going to yeah. talk in a little bit about how you got there. But before we do, let's introduce another panelist today, Armando Velgara. You know, him and I have a lot more like uh, than he knows, but we'll talk about that in just a sec. Let's take a look at his bio package. Armando Vergara is a Cuban and Puerto Rican trombonist, composer, band leader, and educator from South Florida, currently based in New York City. He graduated from the Manhattan School of Music in 2019 with a Bachelor of Music in Jazz Arts and has performed and recorded with world-renowned musicians such as Gonzalo Rubalcaba, Bobby Sanabria, John Faddis, Paquito de Rivera, Maria Schneider, Randy Brecker, Benny Benack III, Stephen Feifke, Maria Bacardi, Sean Jones, and many more. Armando is the founder-creator of Mestizos. Mestizos adds a new wavelength to the Latin music, Latin jazz scene in New York City, but also doubles as a vehicle for Latin jazz music education. Armando teaches private classes in his studio and has given master classes at several schools in New York City and South Florida. Armando. Hey, what's up? How's it going? How are you? <laughs> so what you don't know is that you and I, brother, are Boricua Cubans on this panel. Oh, right on. Yeah, represent. <laughs> Let's do it. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not a trombonist, though, so like they, I don't have nothing alike in that aspect. Um, <laughs> but I was excited to know that I would have a, a fellow Boricua Cuban on the panel today. How are you feeling? I feel good, you know, being a Boricua Cuban, you know, I feel like I get the, the best of both worlds. Um, but yeah, I f I'm excited to be on the panel today. And, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear what other people have to say and, you know, how we how we dig into, you know, how we make sounds for music and, and films and stuff. So yeah, I'm super excited. Absolutely. And we're going to talk about how music plays a role in film. And as a trombonist, the amount of emotional impact you contribute to film with music. And so we're going to talk about that. Let's bring all of our panelists together. Sound in a movie includes music, dialogue, sound effects, ambient noise, background noise. It creates soundtracks. It gives us cues to scary moments, romantic moments, humorous moments, right? Sound in film is absolutely everything. And we know that. You all know that more than I know that. I want to start the discussion by having you all describe for us the best use of sound that you have seen in production, whether that's your own or someone you've admired or a company that has done it better, right? Where have we seen it done well? All right, Armando, let's let's start with you. OK, um, so actually, in uh, 2017, I was uh, uh, able to be a part of this project that um, reworked the music of uh, West Side Story. And it pretty much reworked and reimaginated the music uh, to adapt it to rhythms from the Latin American diaspora. So such as Puerto Rican bomba, Cuban song, uh, Venezuelan, uh, Aropo, you know, uh, et cetera. You know, there's, you know, the score is really, really big. And, but anyway, um, so yeah, the, the idea of the project was to adapt it to those Latin rhythms. 
So when I got called to um, uh, record on the project, uh, by the way, the project is called West Side Story Reimagined and under Bobby Sanabria. And luckily it got nominated for a Grammy in 2017. But um, yeah, so before I got called for that, um, I figured that, you know, maybe I should watch the movie. I have never seen West Side Story before. So, you know, so I checked it out. And um, one of the first things I noticed when, when I was watching is like, when the movie starts, there's this whistle. It's super um, ominous and it's in the interval of a tritone. So I don't know if you guys know what a tritone is, but it's a note that's three um, whole tones away from its originating note. And it's very dissonant. Um, and historically it's been like in the med medieval times, uh, it was illegal to write with a tritone because it was considered the devil, the devil's interval actually. But, you know, as time passed and, you know, more freedom and artistic expression came, you know, but anyway, so the first thing you hear when you uh, start West Side Story is that whistle. And I thought it was really cool because throughout the movie, you hear that same motif through all these different contexts. So, so in the beginning, there's this big gang fight starting with the with the ominous whistle and everything. And throughout the musical, there's, you know, it it uh, carries that motif through these different contexts. So you hear the tritone in this huge gang fight and then... Uh-oh, we lost him. Oh. It's okay. Oh. He's gonna join us. No, no te preocupes. I mean, look. In the world of COVID, like these technological glitches is like you sneezing in a meeting. Da bien, yeah. all right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's, hey, let's hear yeah. from you. Hey, Armando, you're back. Yeah, I guess I got disconnected there. But um, as I was saying, um, yeah, the, you know, you, see, you hear it in all these different contexts and, you know, in a big gang fight and also in, uh, you know, when Tony and Maria are dancing together in, in love. So I think it's pretty brilliant how Leonard Bernstein was able to sort of juice that motif of the tritone throughout the whole musical. And um, I think that's probably one of the best things I've heard. So I'm thankful to be able to be introduced to that through the project I did. So, yeah. That's phenomenal. Um, that's phenomenal. Yeah. Natasha? Well, it's more not, it's not more of my personal work. It's just more of some of my favorite things that I watched recently. Um, in terms of licensed music that I saw, I was recently watching Handmaid's Tale. And there's some episodes that they use licensed music to perfectly set the situation or to cap off a scene. Um, there's one in particular that really struck me. Um, in season three, I'm not gonna give any spoilers, but <laughs> there's a particular scene in the end where they use, uh, I forgot the artist's name, but the song is called Cloud Surfing. And it caps off uh, this scene where the character herself mm -hmm. uh, gets justice. And it is so sweeping and it's so satisfying with what happens. And it really just made me emotional with, what is happening uh, in terms of other examples that I can think of since I love music. And what really excites me is when either a scene or a trailer uh, edits, edits it very well, especially with original music. There's a video game called Final Fantasy XIV. And two of its recent expansions, especially Shadowbringers, uh, it's a cinematic trailer it uses original music, uh, its own original theme song to this really dark and really, uh, really epic um, six minute trailer that has its own underscoring, its own buildup, and it reaches to this climax that really just makes me excited. What, whenever, every time I see that trailer, it's one of my favorite trailers from that game. I, I always cry because <laughs> because of how much it builds up and it just hits that it hits that note that just it gives me it gives me goosebumps yeah i mean sound has this ability right to evoke a ton of emotions like when i watched 
some of the best movies. I don't think that it's the scene necessarily with the actors that make me cry. It's everything that leads up to that moment. Like mm-hmm. I'm already crying <laughs> yeah. before getting to that Absolutely. moment. Mm-hmm. Ben, tell us, where have you seen the best use of sound in production? Oh man. Yeah, so I've been thinking about this, trying to answer this one. It's a tough one. Uh, I'd say uh, for music, I mean, I gotta go with like any Scorsese movie ever made. So anything, you know, Goodfellas. Uh, Goodfellas, I actually, uh, I read a, a crazy story about um, where uh, there was a scene where they use Eric Clapton's Layla, right? And it wound up becoming the theme song for the movie. During that scene, Scorsese actually played the music on set so that all the camera movements would like match, you know, the uh, the music and the and the tone he was trying to set. So that for me, that was always a beautiful thing. Um, and then for sound design, I think in recent years, Sound of Metal, I think was was pretty unbelievable. Um, and that was a movie that came out last year, um, and it's about a metal drummer who's going deaf, uh, who's losing his hearing, which is like his tool, it's everything he has. Um, and so they created this illusion of like going deaf. And it's it's pretty, it's pretty striking because it's not really about making it like sound good. It's really just about actually making it sound like painful, you know, painful to listen to. There's a lot of grinding. Um, and it's just fascinating to me, you know, it's just, uh, it was amazing because you would think that it's about like this metal drummer and it's the sound of metal, but it's actually like the implants when he gets them in his ear, it's a metallic sound. And so it's just fascinating. It's like, God damn, like that guy, give that, <laughs> give that editor everything, you know? So I think he actually won the Oscar. Um, oh, so that's, that's it for me. Yeah. That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. We know that sound is important. But we also know that sound and Im- images and collaboration are important. How can sound and images work together to make a moment and a story memorable? And Natasha, I want to start with you, right? Because you have this ability through animation to do things with images in partnership with sound that allow you to almost memorize every single moment in in, yeah. in that scene. And so Talk to us about how you utilize both images and sounds to make one moment extremely memorable. Man, um, <laughs> it is really, it is a pretty tedious process uh, to get to that really good balance of, of good sound and also a great storyboarding uh, and subtle animation. Um, it starts with uh, me storyboarding and, p- and putting the animatic, I would just find uh, music that would convey the emotion, that would convey a certain um, environment of what I wanted to see. Uh, it is usually uh, music that I will find online. And then when I animate and go to post-production, uh, that's where I start to use uh, my, sa- my sound design skills, uh, look for the best uh, sound effects, and try to find a good amount that is not overused nor underused. Um, and with that, I can uh, talk to my composer and I would describe to her. I would describe to her, okay, this scene is more playful and it's much more energetic, but then we go to the scene by near the end of, well, for using as an example, Magic Play. Uh, with Magic Play, there's a scene in the end where it's pretty hopeless. Um, and it's uh, pretty bleak. So I described her, uh, hey, there's not, there's gonna be minimal sound in this, and, but when this part of the moment hits, uh, hit with uh, piano notes. Uh, that's what uh, ended up in the film. So for that moment to hit, um, I didn't use any, I didn't use much sound. And for voices for the two kids, um, I had to use uh, as, I had to be careful with that. I had to be careful with the sound, with the voices of the kids because you you can over vocalize them and it can be really jarring. So I used as little as possible for that moment to just be perfect in my mind since that is the climax of the film, the resolve of the characters. And 
when I got the music back from my composer, it really it really hit for me. It was perfect. I and I congratulate her for what she did. And that's how it ended up in the film. Oh, that's awesome. So we have another panelist, Dennis Pagan. He just joined us. And and you all know this, right? When you're working with sound, sometimes you have your day planned out and then something comes up in one of your projects and your entire calendar yeah. <laughs> just is obliterated, yeah. right? Uh, and it doesn't yeah. matter what you have planned for yourself. And today, Dennis had one of those moments. His project called him um, and took him away from us. But it seems like our conversation has brought him back. Yeah. Let's take a look. <laughs> let's take a look before we bring Dennis to have our, our conversation with us. Let's take a look at his bio package. Dennis Bagan is a two-time Emmy Award-winning audio post engineer and TV film music composer for his work for Atención Atención in their TV series. Trained as a classical and popular music guitarist. Ay, it looks like we were a little cut short. But está bien. I want to bring Dennis to the conversation. Dennis, how are you? Hey. Hi, guys. How are you feeling? Hey. I'm fine. I made it. I, I cut it short. I was in a meeting right now and I had to cut it short. I really apologize to everybody, but um, I'm in the middle of this uh, episode of series that is airing uh, first episode on August uh, 10 for Fox. And it's, uh, you know, when you have an airtime, it's go for everybody pretty much 24-7. But I'm here. <laughs> How are you guys? Yes, yes. And and we're, we're super excited, Dennis, to have you a part of the conversation. You know, you are an award-winning um, producer. And we know that your job is extremely important, right? We know that without you being called to your projects, uh, miracles are not possible with the things that you're able to produce. All right, let's get back. So we're talking about how can sound and images work together to make a moment and a story memorable. Ben, give us, give us your perspective. How, how are we making moments memorable with images and sound? Oh man, um, well, they have to rely on each other, right? They have to complement each other. Yeah. So I think um, to Natasha's point, like, like what I, I have a similar approach where like at the beginning, sometimes what I'll do is, you know, it'll start with an animatic, but like, I'm not good at that at all. So for me, it's like, usually just like, I call it a slate cut. And so I'll just literally edit the video with just text on the screen. And I'll just write kind of what I, what I want to hear, or what I want to see at certain points. Um, and for me, that's always been an approach that works, but I think um, what makes a moment in a story memorable, I'd say, Hmm. I'd say an example of one that I always loved. I keep talking about gangster movies, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> one is uh, in The Godfather. Um, what I always loved about that movie is there's one scene in particular where there's this dilemma. Michael Corleone doesn't know if he's going to kill the cop or if he's not going to kill the cop. And what they do is in the background, a lot of people don't notice this. They have this like subway sound that keeps getting louder and louder and it's like screeching and the camera's moving closer to him and the sound's getting louder. And then you look around the restaurant, there's no subway there. So it's like completely unmotivated, but it works because we're in New York and you know we kind of accept that there's subways in New York. Um, and what it did was, I think that screeching sound just like commented on like, like his mental state, you know, like how like all over the place he was and how scared he was and, you know, how chaotic it was. So uh, for me, it's it's things like that that always make, you know, a moment more memorable, you know. Absolutely. Dennis, how, how do you think images and sound make a memorable moment? Well, in my line of uh, work uh, for the five, seven years, I've been more of a sound designer than anything else. Um, and of course, this, you know, speaks to me very closely for what I do every day. Um, but it's, it's an interesting question because the way sound uh, can coexist and help on the same level, uh, you know, the images uh, that we're seeing in any given uh, project uh, can be as intense 
as any award-winning movie for its sound, like let's say Saving Private Ryan or Inception, where uh, the sound is is clear, it's clear face, not necessarily in terms of uh, volume or level. Also, be something more of a documentary type of style, where you need to be more stuck and more just uh, accentuating wherever it needs to be and not making yourself uh, known. You know what I mean? Because yeah. Yeah. Um, it's it, it, it sound and, 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 and that you're seeing inside the screen, or it can be used uh, a lot of times to just try to give base to where the action or the dialogue is happening and, and, yeah. and make it a very subtle thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, uh, absolutely. Because so, in, in terms of images, you, you get what you get and you have to. Dennis, are you, is someone mixing behind you, mixing sound? Not, not, not me. No? Okay. No. <laughs> it seems, uh, may, may, maybe sound has consumed your space. <laughs> wow. <laughs> we, we wanted, so we teased you a little bit. We didn't see your full biopic because you were late, but um, I want, yeah. I want the audience to see your full bio package. Also, Dennis produces the sound for all of the commercials and interim video packages for Tu Cuentas in a Youth Fest. And so I want to make sure that credit is given where credit is due um, in terms of the song that plays in the video. But let's take a look at your bio package before we move forward. Dennis Pagan is a two-time Emmy Award-winning audio post engineer and TV film music composer for his work for Atención Atención in their TV series. Trained as a classical and popular music guitarist at the University of Puerto Rico. Dennis has worked extensively in the advertising industry for clients such as Claro, Wendy's, J.C. Penney, Procter & Gamble, United Ways, Toyota, and Home Depot, among others. Dennis has also won recognition at the Cannes Festival as well as Cuspid Awards in Puerto Rico. Have won Sachi and Sachi several FIAP medals in the radio category. Presently, he works as a sound engineer for Reactor Post. Impressive. Absolutely impressive. <laughs> Awesome. So we, we are going to keep going with the conversation. And the next place I want to go is how are we working collaboratively, right? How do we use all of our critical thinking with sound um, and film and be able to work together with the team? So how do you bring collaborative thinking of your team together to ensure the best possible use of sound and images to complement your film? Right, so it's that collaborative thinking. We all know film's not done in isolation. Film is not a one person team. This is no way that would be possible. You have to be extremely talented to make that possible. Tell us, how do you work collaboratively with your teams? Armando. Um, so I think it's important, you know, as a composer um, to keep an open mind uh, about things and to, to have uh, you know, you can, you can use anything as inspiration pretty much. And I think if I were to like score a film scene, I would have to have maybe three or four different versions of, or even more than that of, you know, of the product to like, you know, show the director and, you know, have them like choose between, you know, what I have for them because, you know, everyone's sound palette is a little different, you know, for, for the most part, we can agree like when something's ominous or when something's like exciting, but, um, you know, when it comes to like people's artistic visions, you know, they can get very specific. So, you know, what I'm hearing in my head might not be something that someone else is hearing or the director is hearing or so-and-so. So if, you know, I haven't worked on a, with, with, huge teams uh when you know composing for different mediums but uh i think you know if you show your your work to different minds like such 
like show it to a to a five year old or show it to, um, you know, your mother or, you know, some some people, different people from the community that obviously have different uh, perspectives. And, you know, I like to get what their opinion on is is on it before, you know, I, you know, uh, show it, show the final products to the director and. You know, so it doesn't ha necessarily have to always be like your team. You could you could draw inspiration and, uh, you know, different perspectives and worldviews and, you know, uh, you know, apply it to to your work. And um, I think that's, um, you know, a way, you know, to to sort of, you know, get the ball rolling, you know, creative creatively, you know. No, absolutely. And wouldn't you agree that our lived experiences also affect how we listen and what uh, our our ears pick up on, right? Absolutely. And so I love yeah. I love the idea, the five year old mommy, abuela, to ha to be able to give that feedback. I think that's fantastic. Absolutely. <laughs> Dennis. Yeah, well, I've had the opportunity to work um on uh, on, a, on a freelance level by myself all the way to medium teams which is what i'm doing right now i'm part of a um of an audio team of uh, six people uh, right now and uh, i'm i myself for example for, like i said before even though i did uh advertisement for a lot of uh, for many years right now i'm more focused on film um and the the collaborative uh thinking uh, of, a, of, of a team effort is very, very challenging. It's very good because you can get focused on a specific uh, a thing that you have to do for the team. Um, but at the same time, you have many people uh, talking about it at the same time. So I, I come to bring the other side of it, uh, which I feel I must. It, it, um, what Armando is saying is so true. Is so true. It's 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 beautiful to be able to uh, to speak with a lot of minds about the project that you're working on and get these feedbacks. But but at the same time, when you are working against time on a, a, a with a production company that is expecting results, uh, which is what you guys know uh, is what our industry is all about, uh, you know, because of time constraints, then you start getting uh, sometimes too much feedback. And then people that are the decision makers um, start to change their minds in the middle of the project. Um, and then you can be doing something really good, really uh, it, it really helping a scene or the storytelling of the, of the whole project. And then all of a sudden it gets thrown away because somebody yeah. doesn't are completely sure that it's, uh, that it's gonna work or not. And, and sometimes you just gotta let people work, you know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. <laughs> Natasha, it seems as if you have a lot of sound outside. And we know public sound can also be utilized yeah. in film, right? <laughs> yeah, as, a, as an environment, I'm sorry for the sound that is going on outside. It's out of my control. But um, with, my, with my films, it's really, it's actually really fun to do ambient, ambient sounds just finding the sounds that I want. And it sometimes doesn't have to be the sound from the exact uh, situation. Uh, what I mean is that, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, with my newest uh, short, uh, Place to Place, um, there's the opening shot is an airport. And I used uh, sounds from uh, interior sounds from an airport. Uh, but I also use sounds uh, for uh, droning sounds or maybe some mechanical sounds in the, in the background, wind, uh, car sounds. And, and just adding these up uh, bit by bit, it, would, it, it makes it engaging. It makes it engaging that you can get into the scene mm -hmm. and just uh, follow it along. Um, and with sound, with sound design, uh, it can be really tricky to just get that right sound mixing and balance. You just have, you just have to be with the, with the volume of it just to see if it's right, if it doesn't compete with the dialogue. But 
uh, when it when it gets to that point that it's good, then the scene works. It, the scene succeeds. That's phenomenal. That's, but Ben, what are your thoughts? No, I I agree with everything everybody's been saying. I think it's um it's it's tough because I'm not so I wasn't like formally trained, you know, in sound editing or mixing or anything. I went to film school and and I did video and then I just realized that um I guess my videos were enhanced by sound always. So I did a lot of music videos. Uh I would do like intro sequences. Um and when I started directing more um, and working with teams, I guess a lot of it comes down to the direction, you know, it comes down to how you're actually communicating to your team, how the scene or how the video or, or whatever should feel. Um, so for me, you know, sometimes it's like, I'll actually make the sound, like I'll actually say like, you know, you know, and then there was like, a whoosh, you know, and like, hopefully somebody will, will do that. Um, but it's always a good jumping off point for me. And, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think, I think it comes down to trusting your team and, and, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, letting their artistry be like, it's okay for other artists to be a part of your project. You know what I mean? Um, so that Absolutely. works for, for me. That's, that's the approach. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's um, important to have different, perspectives you know in your in your um projects you know because sometimes you know someone could say something that you never even thought of and then it could you know blow up into something that you like even more and you know Definitely. You, like you know you take inspiration from every like i was saying before you know you, you know it's important to have an open mind so i i really agree with what ben said there you know yeah sure. i, I want to do an experiment right uh and we're gonna do a poll here how would we, what genre, what movie genre would Natasha's background sound be used in? Ben. Oh, <laughs> horror film. <laughs> <laughs> Armando. Maybe like a war film or, you know. War a film. Full so metal like aircraft, right? <laughs> yeah. Then he's a very experimental psychological thriller. All right. <laughs> psychological psychedelic film. Oh, no. I love that. Yeah, all, all I could think about, I was with Armando, right? I thought it was like, I thought like war was imposing on this yeah. video. I was like, oh, no. We got yeah. cyber hacked. <laughs> it's like a no, quiet actually, place. Yeah. It's actually, yeah. It smells like a vacuum that is going outside. It's not even from my house. <laughs> oh, I was about to. I was about to say, man, the Puerto Rico Public Noise Commission. I mean, they're on it, ready to produce film. <laughs> That's funny. Let's let's talk about music and sound, right? And how they shape emotional responses. I want you all to describe to the young people who are watching, who are being inspired to send in their own videos. And if you do it before August second, submissions will be free. Let's describe the ways you select music or sound to shape emotional responses do you guys have a special selection pro process armando let's start with you what is your selection process like yeah so um i work with logic <laughs> pro x and i have you know a couple different plugins such as omnisphere and uh native instruments and uh Honestly, it's pretty overwhelming when you open the library of sounds and, you know, because they're not necessarily categorized by mood or feeling. So you can, you know, go on like horror and then get all the horror sounds. You know, you kind of have to, you know, make it work for yourself. So what I did in the beginning is, you know, I would just spend hours going down the sound library and like sort of categorizing the sounds that I really liked and how they made me feel and what their number was so I could go back and use it like <laughs> in the future. Um, but yeah, so, you know, so that's that's kind of the process that I did in the beginning. And, you know, it's it's cool because like with those plugins, you know, you, you can get a world of possibilities and you can even like edit those sounds to like more of your, uh, you know, uh, liking. And I remember this one time I was going down the, the library in Omnisphere and there was this one sound that, you know, going back to the war movie, uh, <laughs> you know, like, 
when when in the war movies where you know they're in battle you hear all this stuff like the guns the airplanes the screaming and then out of nowhere like this big boom happens and then like the sound goes off and there's just really high ringing like you know the the ringing that you get in your ear and then slowly you know you start to regain your hearing uh, I found a sound on that and I'll, it just like made me think of, you know, the war movie. Like it's a it's a cliche because it's in so many, you know, that that one like sort of, you know, sound. But it's so effective, you know, and that's why, you know, people keep on using it. You know, it's it's something that, you know, uh, will always convey intensity and like, you know, like, wow, something crazy just happened, you know, like. With like, you know, going on to like minimal sound, you know, just this high ringing pitch, you know, after all of this crazy sound happening to like go out and now it's just this, you know, I think that always conveys perfectly like the intensity of war, you know, so, <laughs> you know, so I think, uh, you know, that's sort, that's sort of like my process, you know, to try to categorize things and how they make you feel. But you also got to remember, you know, like I said earlier, people have different sound palettes so you know absolutely good to have you know options so absolutely. and we know you know a vacuum can make a warlike good sound instrument we know yeah. that now absolutely yeah yeah, hey, it's fine. yeah. <laughs> natasha what are what are your thoughts so hopefully the the vacuum doesn't impose war on us here <laughs> i i just i just hope that they're finished by now because i didn't know that was going to happen <laughs> but but yeah for I have to I have a specific uh, process for both uh, music and sound. For sound design, I usually go to freesound.org or download videos off of YouTube. And normally, um, there will be sounds that I'm looking for specifically that are not available. So I have to improvise and uh, try to mix uh, two sounds that I find and combine them so that it would be similar to the sound that I'm looking for or what I'm hearing. Um, I have to time them very well too. And with that, it can be really tedious uh, because um, you would find this sound and it's not the uh, volume that you're looking for or the type of uh, feeling that you are looking for. So you're looking, you're downloading another sound and you use it and it and it sounds very well. So let's combine it with another one. Okay, this doesn't combine well. Let's grab this one. And then you end up with 200 sound files in your download folder <laughs> by the end of the day, which happened yeah. to me once, but <laughs> which, which can be really, um, really stressful when you look at all the sound files together like that in a long list. Uh, but for music, um, I had two different experiences uh, with both Magic Play and Place to Place. Uh, Magic Play, it was it was my senior year film. So I was putting up posters, uh, looking for people. And one of the people that, one of the things that I was looking for is composer. So I put my email there and waited a few days until I got a response uh, from a student called Shanae Roberts. And at the time she was a second year and I think she was a student for visual effects, but she was working for music as a minor. I heard her portfolio, and from there I said, "This is what this is what I want. I want her in." <laughs> and it was, and she was the first composer that com contacted me, and no one else. So I grabbed her, and I'm happy to have had her in the in the film, especially since half of the film, half of Magic Play, wouldn't be what it is if it wasn't for her music. Oh, and phenomenal. for place to place, yeah, for place to place, um, I put up a social media post because music was the last thing that I wanted to work on. I wanted to get production, uh, compositing, sound design all the way, so that the one thing that I need to worry the most is who can compose the music. And I already knew compose some composers at the time, but there was one composer that I, I wanted to get. And that was Danny Dice. Um, he is, uh, he's from Instagram and he normally does anime music, but he can also do some great instrumentals as well. So I put up a social media post and I wanted, I wanted him to respond. I didn't, I didn't even DM him or anything. I just put up the post and waited for a day until he responded to me. And 
I said, got you. I, I thought, got you. I'm going to get you on my film. <laughs> and he did such an amazing job uh, with, with shorts, which is so energetic, so much, so much fun. And it embodies the film so well. And he told me that he told me that um, I can uh, if you want if you want I can always work with you. I wanted to work with you on your one of your projects um, for a year, so I'm really happy that I got him to work on the film. Fantastic! That's awesome. That That's fantastic. Yeah, I can relate to everything that uh, Natasha was describing in terms of how she was so. Um, eager to work with uh, somebody specifically because of their uh, style, maybe, you know, uh, or the genre or the way they, they compose. Because uh, in my case, the many times in the past that I've had to work, uh, let's say, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to divide it like Natasha did, for example. When it comes to sound, my, my process in, in, in working with choosing the sounds that need to be uh, used or that can more closely uh you know uh, uh help to tell the story i even though even though i i i gotta say i always say to everybody it's always important to know what is the standard in terms of formulas that everybody does to in terms of sound design to uh you know work on on this type of uh, uh in our on our industry on what we do you also have to go a lot by by feeling, by by trusting yourself, you, you know, we're professionals and or 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 you know or or, or or professionals to be like you know a lot of guys that are maybe are watching us and um, uh, I I go a lot by inspiration, like uh, uh, in terms of sounds, I I I work a lot with the sound miner, which is my 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 main program for organizing the metadata and all the sound libraries that I've, I I work for, and I when I'm looking for a specific sound to con to convey an emotion or to uh, just you know uh, uh, help with, with a concrete sound something that you may be something mundane even mundane when, that, that that you uh, that you're seeing in a scene um, I don't necessarily I start by the regular name of what I'm looking for, let's say a door, all right? Something as mundane as that. Mm -hmm. But once I do, once I do, I, a lot of times, I start not paying attention to how they're, they're named. <clears throat> I just listen. And when you do that, when you do that, all of a sudden, something that's not a door becomes a door for the movie, you know? Yeah. And, and it's and all, of, all of a sudden, it's the perfect door for that scene. <laughs> Because yeah. you know the story, and you know that when that person is opening the door, let's say it's going, they're going to find their lost love of their life again, and this door all of a sudden becomes important for 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 that, you know, for the for that storytelling, and and yeah. all of a sudden just by listening to it, you say that's it, but it's not a door. Well, now it is. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when it music at the many times in the past that I've uh, worked as composer also um, just like Armando said um, I work with all of that with Omnisphere with Native Instruments and all these libraries and they're, they're awesome and it's uh, what I love about these uh, libraries is the fact that they are inspiration in a box I mean I love the fact that you can sit down and just keep scrolling and watching uh, yeah, you know your sounds and listening to them and you just keep hearing those keys and 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 all of a sudden you're like oh my god that is beautiful how can I get it to work on this scene and sometimes you get it to work and sometimes you don't but it'll get you somewhere else it'll definitely get you somewhere else sometimes I even get obsessed on something that I know that's not going to work for what I'm for that cue that I'm working that I'm going to be working on but I say I gotta just store it on my favorites because this is going to become something and and every time Every time you work on a project, you you get a little piece of yourself into that yeah. project. It, it doesn't matter if, as uh, how, how corporate you want to go. When you love what you do and this business, you are leaving a part of you inside that project. There's no way mm -hmm. I can make something sound like somebody else that's, that is not me. It's the way I work. And and somebody like some like my re-recording mixer sometimes tells me, "Hey, Dennis." It's weird 
the way you layered this uh, thing to sound, because normally I was like scrolling and soloing the layers that you put in there, and I didn't like that. I didn't like them that very much. But together, they work, man. I don't know how you do it. I'm like, I don't know how I do it sometimes either. But that's the way I do it. <laughs> That that is awesome. That information is gold. And I, I as your moderator today, am learning a ton. And so I can imagine every young person and every person who has tuned in today is learning so much. You all are composers. Uh, many of y'all were expertise in sound and images. Ben, relationship like with producers and directors. What does that communication flow look like? as you are engineering sound? Great question. Um, <laughs> let me think about that for a second. Um, well, I'd say I do have, so there's a select group kind of that I love working with. Um, you know, you build relationships with the people you work with. Uh, I think it's a different approach for each director. Um, and what I do is mainly music videos. So it's funny because it's kind of, I have the same, uh, I guess I have the same approach as a lot of these guys who just spoke, but I think that one thing that's really different is for me, the music is actually what motivates the visuals. So it's like, it's almost backwards. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it comes down to, like I said earlier, it comes down to direction, properly setting, probably talking about what emotion a director is looking for. Um, sometimes the director doesn't even comment on it. And I'll, you know, I'll listen to a song, it'll make me feel a type of way. And then what I'll do in my intro is I'll create that atmosphere through, you know, whatever the, the drone is in the background or whatever, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I remember one video I was working on where um, I had, uh, I had the video started with somebody's phone ringing and it was a vibration. And so we did this vibrating sound and every single YouTube comment was like, oh my God, I thought my phone was going off. And it was funny because we we wanted to create that. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I think, it, I hope it does, you know? Uh, yeah, no, it's, it speaks to a relationship, right? And, and yeah. often I'm sure that you all engage with different types of directors, right? Some yeah. a bit more micromanaging, some like allow you to fully invest and immerse yourself in, into the project. And so I've always been curious about what that dynamics like, right? And if there's a process you all carry yourselves in navigating those relationships within your projects. Armando, what, what are some of your experiences? Right, so like what Ben was saying, you know, every uh, situation is, you know, uh, unique and you never know. Uh, I think it's just important to, for the director to clearly, uh, you know, state his artistic vision, you know, and that's sort of the, the biggest thing for me. Cause I've worked with some people that weren't great at, you know, um, like sort of explaining what they want. Like yeah. I've showed, I've showed them, you know, what I've, what I've made for them, but you know, based off what they said and you know it hasn't always you know we haven't always seen eye to eye but um like you said earlier you know some some people have you know a more open mind depending on how they feel about you know your music your expertise some directors just let you take full you know creative freedom uh i remember like i had this assignment to um score this uh this pharmaceutical commercial and um, pretty much, you know, there was, it was this, uh, it was pretty much uh, promoting this pill and there was this like glare of, of light when it was coming through space. It was like kind of a old, old vibe of uh, a uh, pharmaceutical commercial. And uh, yeah, the, he, the, he gave us the assignment and there was like maybe like three or four other composers that he had hired to like kind of see, um, you know, what else, like what other people, you know, came up with. And um, yeah, you know, it's, you know, I, I kind of did my own thing with it and, 
you know, it didn't, it doesn't always like turn out great. You know, I ended up not getting, you know, the gig for it, but it's just always about the, you know, the artistic vision. And if the communication is good between the director and the composer and, you know, I think if, I think it's all about communication really, you know, and, you know, obviously some people are better at it than others. And, you know, like I, like I said, it's all unique um, situations, you know, you got to take it day by day and, you know, project by project. Absolutely. As yeah. we are wrapping up, I want to offer our audience, particularly the young people that are watching. Again, I encourage everyone <laughs> to submit their videos for the film festival that this series is leading up to on September 18th. You have until August 2nd, if you want your submissions to go through for free, what advice for young people who want to engage in sound and images for film, what advice do you all have for them? Natasha? Just go, just go for it. Just, um, if you have something that you want to express, um, you can just go, you can just go for it. And if, if you don't, if you don't know how to do it yourself, um, one that you can, you can always uh, go online and learn uh, how to sound mix for yourself, how to mix different sounds. But also if you know people, especially if they're um, in, uh, involved with art or with film, you can always collaborate collaborate with them. For me, collaboration is always extremely fun, especially when it's people that you know. You can always uh, go back and forth with your ideas, and through that, I think that always um, that always generates the best results uh, in the end. So Absolutely. have fun. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, yeah, have fun, and you know. Don't don't have all the answers. You know what I mean. It's okay to to keep learning. Um, stick with it. Um, you gotta love to learn. You gotta you know go to tutorials, read about it, um, and love it. You know, I mean, it gets tedious, but you know what I've always thought is the only actual thing that works is just sticking with it. So if you stick with it, you'll find your voice and you'll enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, like, you know, these things don't happen overnight, you know, like I have 10 years of musical experience, you know, and training, you know, so just to get to the point where I am now. So, you know, just, you know, we live in the information age. YouTube is a wonderful tool. Uh, definitely, you know, expand your horizons and, you know, take inspiration from anything and, um, and yeah, you know, just I like Natasha said, you know, go for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Dennis, take us home. What is your final advice? And don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> there, you got it. A sound guy that forgets to unmute his mic. So anyway, <laughs> so guys, <laughs> here's the thing. Um, even this is what I wanted to uh, tell everybody, even on the highest level of our industry, we are all still learning. This is an ongoing mm -hmm. process. We're all yep. students. It doesn't matter, I've, I've been doing what I'm doing for 16 years, been a musician all my life, and I still uh, get astounded at, at how much I learn on a per project basis. I mean, ev every project has its particularity and no project is the same. So you have to go with the flow, and and like uh, Natasha also said, uh, I liked it. It's a, it's a, it's a community effort. It's the collaborative effort that gets you to have uh, to to make good products, and not only that, to really you know have fun and learn and, uh, throughout the whole process. So go for it. Absolutely, yeah. I want to thank you all for being here. You guys have taught me a lot. Um, about sound and images. I am sure that our audience has learned a ton. Um, and I just want to thank you all. And I will continue to be a fan of each and every one of you guys. Thank you all for tuning in a conversation among X. Today we discuss evoking emotion and exploring the use of images and sound. I want to invite all of you all to tune back in on August 11th at 4 p.m. We will be having a conversation on women in the director's chair being co-hosted and moderated by my co-moderator, Lorena Rossi. I encourage everyone to tune in, share it, 
Lorena is a phenomenal moderator who just does such a hilarious job at facilitating a conversation. Again, I want to remind our young people that this series, A Conversation Among X, leads up, up to a film festival on September 18th. If you want to submit a film, it can be submitted for free if you do it by August 2nd. Please visit CineYouthFestival.org. Before we head out, I want you to see our sponsors for our show. Thanks to our sponsors, we continue to have important conversations that educate and inspire the most valuable asset for a brighter future. The new generation of Latinx creatives. Visit CineYouthFest.org to find out more because tu cuentas. We all have a story to tell and your story matters. Now more than ever, that's why we've created Cine Youth Fest. A cinema festival and a platform for independent voices, positive change, stories of heroism from the lens of a Latinx experience. Join the adventure on our website, cineyouthfest.org. There, you will find all you need to participate in the competition. The rules of the game, Latinx and film, where you find out how important we really are. Classes behind the camera with people who know. Stories from others like you who have a dream, big ideas, and awesome goals. Raise your voice to be heard. Show off to be seen. And be part of history sharing your story. Lights. Camera. Acción. Because tú cuentas. Powered by H.I.T.N.A.